Everyone who's interested in accumulating Bitcoin needs to check out Lolly. That's L-O-L-L-I. You can find them at lolly.com and on Twitter at TryLolly. Lolly is a free browser extension that lets you earn Bitcoin when you shop online. For every purchase at one of the Lolly merchants, you can get up to 30% of Bitcoin back directly to your wallet. Lolly has partnered with 500 merchants, including Jet, Overstock, SeatGeek, and Priceline. Lolly is safe, completely free to use, and it's a great way to earn and share Bitcoin with family and friends. Don't miss out on your chance to accumulate more Bitcoin for the next bull run. Check it out at lolly.com, that's L-O-L-L-I dot com, and on Twitter at TryLolly. Let's get to the show. Hey guys, this is Mark Yusko from Morgan Creek, and this is Wrecked. Hello and welcome to Wrecked Podcast. I am Bunchu alongside my esteemed colleague and co-host, Crypto Chamber. Chamber, how are you, buddy? Uh, doing pretty good today. Pretty good. Um, I, I, I tweeted out uh, about, I don't know, 45 minutes ago, had breakfast for dinner, which is, you know, a, the end of a, to, 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 to put the cherry on a good day. Uh, breakfast for dinners. There's really nothing better to do there. It's the I also dinner inter- of champions. It's perfect. You're, you're damn right, Mark. It's the dinner of champions. <laughs> <laughs> I also, uh, while eating dinner, uh, my uh, my daughter was wondering um, what uh, what this funny uh, movie poster was on her uh, on her iPad, and I said, "Well, that's Beetlejuice," and uh, she's into some spooky stuff. So I said, "Well, we should probably watch that while we have dinner." So. She got introduced to Beetlejuice, asked a hell of a lot of questions, <laughs> regretted my decision shortly thereafter, uh, and uh, and here we are. So wait, what's the what is the best breakfast food to have for dinner? I'll tell you what I had. Sure. Um, I had uh, fried eggs, uh, bacon. Oh, went full on breakfast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so fried eggs, bacon. I had some mini potatoes that I chopped up with some onions and garlic and butter on a cast iron uh, on a cast iron pan, and some rye toast, uh, and it was it was pretty good. Oh, oh. See, that's almost perfect. Fried what did eggs, I miss? Bacon, the hash browns, but forget the rye toast. Let's go with banana pancakes or blueberry pancakes. Let's yes, go full on. solid. You got to go know, pancakes. If you if you don't have like the sweet breakfast food as part of the dinner. It's not complete, I don't think. But I'm getting taken to school here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially with you, with a uh, lifetime supply of maple syrup up there. In I Canada. do have a lifetime supply of maple syrup. <laughs> so you know, yeah, that's a good point. Awesome. I am well, taking you know, notes. I love the fact. I love the fact that that we're talking, uh, or I'm talking to somebody in Canada today. Given that tomorrow night, I am actually headed to the Great North. Uh, so it's so funny. We have a, a little guy, an eight year old, and. Uh, we asked him, you know, so what do you want to do this summer? And without skipping a beat, he says, go to Canada. Wow. Like, where did, where, no where kidding. Where did that come from? So <laughs> tomorrow we're heading up to Toronto and Montreal for four days. So Wow. Oh, you're going to love it. You'll be uh, right by Chamber. Yep. You're, you're near awesome. Toronto, right? Yeah, I'm just right around the corner from Toronto. You're going to love Toronto. Montreal, though, that's uh, that's the I've real one. That, that one you're going to like a lot. Yeah, we're excited. We're excited. It's going to be fun. And so you've heard him already. Joining us today, we have Mark Yusko, the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creek Capital. We're super excited to have you, Mark. How you been? Doing great, doing great, and uh, really excited to, to do this with you guys. It's, it, uh, it seems like our world has just uh, gone a little uh, surreal in the last few days with uh, <laughs> everybody on the planet talking about crypto and and Bitcoin. And, you know, if you would have told me that uh, in just 10 short years, we'd have the president of the United States, the secretary of the Treasury and the chairman of the Fed all talking about magic Internet money, I would have said, yeah, you're crazy. But here we are. It is. It has been a very interesting couple of days. Um, yeah, it's 
wild. Uh, and now, do you think this all came about? I mean, it all has come since the announcement of Libra. Do you think that's kind of the catalyst of why all of a sudden we're seeing uh, a lot of these topics being talked about at such a, a high level? Or um, do you think it was inevitable either way? Um, what's your thoughts there? I definitely think it was inevitable either way. So I think, you know, what, what happened here is Libra was certainly the catalyst because there's so much misunderstanding and confusion at these high levels. You know, they don't even understand that Libra is not a cryptocurrency. Right. It's a, it's a digital currency. It's not a crypto. And so they, they conflate all these terms. And so there's no question that over time, as a larger percentage of wealth around the world migrates to sound money, which is Bitcoin, uh, they would have eventually had to acknowledge that, that cryptocurrency is on a path, I think, long term to, to replace fiat currency, uh, not tomorrow or the next day or even a decade, but over a very long period of time. And I think they would have figured it out. But what this announcement by Facebook does is it makes them wake up. Now, they should have woken up four years ago when Tencent did, I mean, I'm sorry, Alibaba did kind of the same thing. Alibaba mm -hmm. created without a token, but they created the third largest money market in the world in nine months. They announced that they were going to start paying interest on deposits. People deposited money into their Alipay account and boom, they raised $90 billion. And it was, happened so fast that the People's Bank of China actually had to change the rules to stop them from draining deposits out of the bank system. Uh, and that's exactly what's going on here is the reason this is suddenly so important to our chief banker, right? The head of the Fed, his only job is to protect the banking cartel. Then you got the secretary of the treasury whose only job is to protect the job, the guy whose job is to protect the banking cartel. And then you got the guy <laughs> whose big donors are all part of the banking cartel, all telling him, hey, wait a second, this is, this is bad stuff. You got to regulate this guy. And what people finally woke up to, in my mind, is that you know, Libra has the potential to hit an installed base of 1.6 billion people around the world instantaneously. Right. And that's the one thing that I always thought was missing with Bitcoin is it's still too concentrated in terms of ownership. I feel like there should have been a big airdrop to everybody at the beginning. And then you could decide if you want to opt in or opt out or pay to play or whatever. But, um, the broad distribution of Libra is a huge threat to the banking system. So one of the things you just mentioned uh, is sound money, right? And I think that's kind of the the big difference between what something like Bitcoin is versus what Libra will be, right? And um, can you just describe for anybody out there kind of who may not know or think about it in this type of way, when you say sound money, what do you mean? Yeah, so sound money is money that is backed by something, by a, a commodity. So it was gold-backed currency or silver-backed currency. In fact, you know, the pound sterling, hence the name, right? It was one pound of sterling silver. Mm -hmm. And, you know, originally gold certificates, you know, paper certificates were redeemable uh, for gold or silver. And so you had a, a commodity currency. And, and the reason that was valuable is that you know, the collective society agrees by custom that exchanging some commodity for a good or service is a sound practice. So you have sound money. Well, what happened over time is as governments did what they always do, which is overspend, they realize they can't ever pay back the debt. They don't want to default on the debt because then those in power get kicked out of power. So they simply inflate the debt away by devaluing or deflating their currency. In fact, you know, people don't realize why we have the little ridges on our coins. It's because in the old days, the Romans would carve down the sides of the coins to strip out the silver uh, to basically senior, uh, seniorage to steal wealth from the citizens. Hmm, so, really? yeah, it was crazy. And so over time, we've developed um, this penchant for governments to issue fiat currencies, fiat meaning by decree with no backing other than some, you know, printing press, literally. And the problem with fiat currencies is they all end the same way, right? I mean, over the history of, of the world, we've had 775 paper currencies going all the way back to the 1300s. And in fact, the first one was, was in China. And 
those currencies, three quarters of them have disappeared, you know, vanished from the face of the earth. And all fiat currencies will eventually vanish from the face of the earth because they're unsound. They have no backing. And it's, I call it the dictator playbook. So when a single person or small group gets in power, what do they do? They seize the assets and then they tax the poor and the middle class by devaluing the currency. And that creates hyperinflation. You've seen it in, you know, over the ages in, in ancient Rome, in, you know, the Turkish Empire, in, the, um, in Germany. You've seen it in, in Zimbabwe. You know, people forget <laughs> the last two years. I'll ask you guys, what's the best performing stock market in the world the last two years? <laughs> I'm I'm cheating because I think I've heard you say the answer. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Let, so <laughs> let me. So Chamber, do you know? Because I know I because no I've idea. heard him talk about it. <laughs> uh, so the best performing stock market out of, out of the last how many years? Two years. Yep. Um, I I I, I want to say I want to say the U.S. stock market, but that's probably not correct. I, no, not even close. <laughs> it's, is it Venezuela? It is. Ding, ding, no ding, ding, way. Ding, ding. Yes. <laughs> and the thing is, would you want to be invested in Venezuelan stocks? Hell no. no. Not unless you're in Venezuela, denominated in bolivars already, and you already own all the assets. But so, Mark, I keep seeing tweets saying that you know the economy in the U.S. is booming, the stock market is booming. I thought that was supposed to be a good thing. Oh my gosh! Okay. <laughs> the economy is not booming. No. And, you know, here's the thing: if you repeat a lie over and over and over, it's still a lie. Sure and, is. You know, that's what goes on in our government. It's it's kind of like this Cold War 2.0 thing with China. You know, we say Huawei is 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 doing all this bad stuff. No. 20 years ago, Huawei did a lot of bad stuff, but today they're just kicking our butt in innovation, particularly in 5G. So think about this, 10 years ago, the US and China were pretty uh, on the same path in, in tech. Mm -hmm. And the US chose to back FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and China chose to back semiconductors and AI. So now we are the world leader in the United States in social media. And China is the world leader in 5G and AI. So which would you rather be? So if you I mean, I do like to watch The Office a lot. Uh, it, it is kind but of I like cool. To watch it in, I like to watch it in 5G, <laughs> yeah. though. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, here's the thing, right? So in rushing home to, to get to see you guys, you know, I, I live in the People's Republic of Chapel Hill, and there are all these dead <laughs> spots because of the NIMBYs. And imagine you're in a self-driving car. Imagine I was in the back of my car and my self-driving car went into one of these dead spots. What happens? Well, I don't, I don't want that to happen, right? I, I need 5G to be you know, really extremely powerful at the edge so that, that my car doesn't run into something or a tree or a deer or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just I find the whole thing really disconcerting when we look at nominal values of U.S. stocks and we don't think about the real implications of the devalue of our dollar. And you look at what things cost today versus what they cost five years ago or 10 years ago. I've been telling this, this anecdote as I, I walk into the local taco place here in Chapel Hill. And for myself, right, a couple tacos, a drink, and tip and tax is like $18. I'm going, it's a lot. Wait, wait a second. Lot. Wait a second. I don't live in New York. I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It shouldn't cost $18. But that's because the value of our currency is slowly being devalued, is being senioraged, and nobody pays attention to that. So they look at the nominal value of stocks and say, oh, we're in this big bull market. Well, I got news for you. Not for you guys, because you get this, but the stock market today is not materially different than it was on January 26, 2018. So we've gone a year and a half with barely any movement. We had a couple downdrafts, a couple recoveries. And we've done a lot of short squeezing and, you know, Mnookin gets out and calls the plunge protection team back on December 24th. And so they've saved us from the calamity that I think is still coming. But, you know, it's a long answer to your very simple point about, you know, the U.S. economy says it's booming and the stock market is booming. Don't believe any of it. So are we going to be in the, uh, you know, 
the sequel to The Big Short in 15 years from now when we're ta- when we're having this conversation on, on the movie and, and who's going to play you, Mark? Uh, ah! that's, really that's, a, that's a great question. Wow, that is that is like the greatest question. Ever. That is an amazing question. Well done. Wow, who would I want to play me? Well, Mark, Mark we've been doing this podcast for a little over a year. We've had 100 shows. And that was the best question Chambers ever asked. Oh, I was waiting for you, I I was waiting for you Mark. <laughs> I am honored. Well, that is, that is very cool. And, and I wish I had a snappy um, reply. I mean, you know, the first guy that comes to mind, just because I'm, you know, I'm vain, is Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> because I, I don't look at all like him. But, um, you know, that's, that's such a great question. Actually, you know who it is? It's George Clooney, right? I mean, because he's, he's the, one. He's the silver fox. He's the silver yeah. fox. I got the white hair. <laughs> So, uh, yep. I don't quite I like, I, have the uh, the hairline see, or the jawline, but I could see that though. I, no, I, think, I, I think that works. That one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. So, so will we be in a Big Short sequel? Is I th- that what's coming? Look, here? I, I absolutely, I actually, I absolutely think we are in in a Big Short sequel, and and where it comes is not in you know the the mortgage market, um, but it it comes in this unwinding of of you know these inter- interrelated global derivatives and you know i think someone asked me the other day what's the catalyst you know what's the canary in the coal mine and i really do think deutsche bank is is has the potential to be that catalyst because the the amount of derivatives on their balance sheet is is pretty vast and you know i i call it affectionately you know the national bank of germany for a reason because it it's way too big to fail so they can't let it fail and they're trying everything they can do to get it shored up, but the equity value today is just so low because people have punished the stock that it's going to be really tough to save in its current form. And the problem is once something like that begins to unwind and once we get a sense for for just how bad the fiat currency world really is, uh, and, and here's our problem, right? It, it all started back in, in 71 when, when we went off the gold standard, when we had the Nixon debacle in the U.S. And, you know, you take this global reserve currency, which had, had always been backed by something historically, mostly gold. And now we're back to fiat. And then we start building this giant global derivative book on top of it. And when the U.S. banks, you know, came close to failing back during the global financial crisis, there's this great story about uh, you know Ben Bernanke like, addressing his team, and he comes in. He says, "Guys, I- I've looked into the abyss, and we are not going there. So, um, <laughs> you know, we are going to do whatever it takes." Kind of before um, Draghi said it, and we're going to do this thing of QE, which, by the way, you know, he didn't invent. Um, the Japanese took an idea from the Depression in the U.S. when we had QE for the first time. And what people forget about the United States, I always joke, you know, Americans are like Notre Dame football fans. They remember a past that never was. And you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a, a huge, co- I'm a huge college football fan, so uh, that I love, I love that. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, Notre Dame fans, if you talk to them, they act like we've won the championship every year. Well, we haven't won since '88. Yeah. That's a long time, <laughs> and yet we still have this arrogance about us, and. And or maybe it's more swagger than arrogance because it's just football. Right. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting about it is, is you ask people why they believe that. So, well, in the 40s, you know, we did win every year. I'm like, well, yeah, because the coach went to Europe during the war and got all the guys from Army and Navy to come back as 28-year-olds. You don't get to do that anymore except at BYU. So, <laughs> yeah, he went undefeated for four years and won three national titles. But the challenge for, you know, that American exceptionalism is – you know, we kind of destroyed the advantage we had of, of fiat currencies. And the real problem, and, and where I think and it's a long answer to your, you know, where's this big short come in? Everything was fine because we cut a deal with Saudi in the early 70s. And we said, all right, here's the deal. We'll protect you as long as you denominate every transaction in oil in dollars. Because then we don't need a gold standard, so we have the petro standard, so we have petrodollars. And that worked really well for a lot of years until people started threatening that. Now, what was interesting about it, maybe not interesting or actually frightening, is if you threaten that, like um, Gaddafi, Gaddafi said, I'm going to 
price in gold, he disappears. Um, Saddam Hussein says, I'm going to price in euros, he disappears. Now, if you don't have nuclear weapons, you just disappear. If you have nuclear weapons like Russia and China, you don't disappear. They just label you currency manipulators and, and you know public enemy number one. So now we're in this funky place where Chinese are starting to price oil transactions not in dollars but in renminbi. The renminbi gets included in the strategic depository receipts um, from the IMF. And suddenly the RMB is a reserve currency, not the. We're still the. But... What's changed is the world reserve currency used to be all about military might. Whoever had the strongest navy um, had the world reserve currency. So in the olden days, it was Portugal because they had the tallest trees, they had the fastest ships. Then they got taken over by Spain, then the Netherlands, then France, and then the U.K. with the steam engine, and then the U.S. with our you know, nuclear navy. Well, what China figured out, which is interesting, is they believe the next war will be won with chips, not ships. And so they arguably have the most powerful cyber com capabilities. And so now you're seeing this kind of global warfare shift. And it's not just, uh, and it's not, you know, on the ground warfare, it's, it's financial warfare. And so now you look at, at the aftermath of the global financial crisis, who cleaned it all up? China. They went around and they bought ports in Greece and they bought mines in Africa and they lent money to um, the Latin Americans so that, you know, when the U.S. declares a trade war, China says, screw you, I'll just buy my soybeans from Argentina because we, you know, bailed them out after the global financial crisis. So everybody loves the guy with all the money now, which is China. And so all of these things come together. So it's, it's not so much like the big short as in one thing takes us all down, but what I think it, it is is this systematic destruction of the global fiat system. And that's why, back to our, our primary topic, right, for the podcast, is how did crypto come to be? How did Bitcoin come to be? Well, it, it was born out of the financial crisis. And I always love that the Genesis Blocks, you know, initial headline is, you know, Chancellor approves second bailout for banks. How perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think... I think one of the funniest things that you said if, if, at just the very beginning of the whole thing about the sound money was backed by something. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you see the Donald Trump tweet the other day and right in the first sentence, I'm not a fan of Bitcoin and any other and other cryptocurrencies, which are not money and whose value is highly volatile and based on thin air which I think was probably the funniest part of the whole tweet. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> Look, I mean, it's so funny, right? All currency is backed by nothing at this point because it's all fiat. And so it's all backed by thin air. And so to say that Bitcoin's backed by thin air is just silly. What Bitcoin actually is backed by is math and cryptography. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, it's funny because people talk about it as, as faith. And I got in, um, not a debate, but kind of just a, a philosophical debate with a guy the other day on Twitter about this saying, you know, now I think about it, people talk about money being faith-based. I'm like, no, it's really not faith-based. It's custom-based. Because it's not about believing in something. Because faith is about believing in something you can't see. Hmm. Custom is about believing in something that has worked in the past. So if, I don't know if you've ever seen the video of the guy who first tried to buy something with gold. No. So it's like a medieval yak meat stand and a guy <laughs> walks up with a chicken, he gets his yak meat and the guy walks up with his block of gold and says, I want my yak. And the guy's like, what is that? He's like, can I eat it? No. Well, can I, you know, do something with it? No. It's like, well, what good is it? It's, it's money. He's like, what are you talking about? It's money. It's a rock. And so the first guy who then said, yeah, you know, I'll take that rock and I'll give you something in return. Well, then the next guy does it, the next guy does it, and the next gal does it. And suddenly custom says that we agree that this thing, whatever it happens to be, is money. And I said in the historical days when that something that we all agreed on was then backed by a government hoard or stash of gold or silver, then it had 
intrinsic or inherent value because you could actually exchange it for something. And I love when people say, well, the dollar's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. <laughs> really? <laughs> so if you go to your government office and you give them that green piece of paper, are they going to give you something for it? Are they going to give you gold? No. Are they going to give you silver? No. Are they going to give you a share of their municipal tax revenue? No. So what's the full faith and credit? Oh, it's backed by the army. Well, no. I mean, do you get a soldier for that dollar? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's where the money is. <laughs> yeah. I could use a couple of soldiers around me on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, that would be a good thing, right? And but <laughs> I think what's interesting is money is a a construct, right? It's something that 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 a society has to agree on by custom and and it's like the United States, right? We had two forms of money during the Civil War. We had the Confederate dollar and, and the U.S. dollar. And one side won. And the Confederate dollars were suddenly worthless. Um, and if you look over time in any country, there have been lots of things that have been currency. We've used shells. We've used copper coins. You know, I talk all the time. I, I carry around in my briefcase uh, what at one time... 5,000-ish years ago, no, 2,600 years ago, was the most powerful currency in the world called a solidus. And it was a copper coin, you know, minted in Rome. And if you had a solidus, you were solid. That's where the word comes from. You were a citizen, and you were worthy of, of other people's attention because you were solid. And today it's a trinket, right? I bought it for a dollar in Rome. And so once the custom goes away or once people lose that willingness to exchange for whatever it is because it's been devalued because there's been too many of them created or too many of them, you know, get concentrated in the hands of too few people. And what governments eventually always do is they overprint and devalue their currency most times today to try to get out of debt. And that's where I think the whole big short is, is, just like we had a real estate bubble in 06, 07, just like we had the derivative bubble tied to that real estate bubble, what we have today is a government debt bubble. I mean, 10-year Greek debt trades below treasuries? Seriously? That's hmm. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I, I want to ask you this, uh, this other question because I, I think it's interesting. I've heard you explain it, and... Uh, I had never really heard about it, um, but like when we talk about, you know, where we're headed and and when, um, you know, you have a pretty interesting theory based on, you know, 14 year cycles uh, across yep. history, across history. Uh, talk a little bit about that and, and what that is and what that might look like for, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain. Yeah. So I think what's really I, I love this this topic and I appreciate you bringing it up because when I had my aha moment, you know, is is when I, it hit me that what we were talking about was technology, that this was not a thing, this was not a you know a, a little tool or a little piece of software or you know some you know add on to to existing tech, but a a true technological evolution. And I talked about this in my last letter about you know financial evolution that it, it's it's not. I mean, it's, it's kind of like how financial natural selection or it's like how natural selection works is it's, it's incremental, it's iterative. And so if you think about computing power and technology, uh, it goes all the way back to 1954 with the mainframe. And you, know, you can remember back then people saying, well, the government had computers, but no company would ever want a computer. And then suddenly companies needed computers and the whole mainframe industry was launched and people had these big giant computers that took up whole buildings. And then 14 years later, uh, they invented the microchip and they were able to make small computers. But people said, well, no, no small company would ever want a computer. You know, no one would, no one would want a Spark workstation or, you know, some big fancy Vax computer, microcomputer. Um, but suddenly people were buying them. And then 14 years later, uh, 1982, the personal computer uh, revolution came along or evolution came along. And Steve Ballmer's mom famously said, honey, why would you go to work for that company? No one would want a computer in their house. And I would say he has, he has 18 billion reasons why he was right. <laughs> mom was wrong. 
and, and a subpar LA basketball team. Oh, so 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 <laughs> subpar that he double paid for, right? Or paid <laughs> twice the value just because he could. That's right. Um, crazy. Um, but it, what's crazy is then 14 years later, we had this thing called the internet, and Paul Krugman said, you know, it'll never be more important than a fax machine. And you know, I remember this vividly that. Um, you know, I was working at, at Notre Dame, and, and suddenly everyone was talking about this, this thing, the Internet. And it was, you know, remember, this was originally a couple university computers with some defense department backing, and they could kind of talk to each other and, and send an email, right? You know, the first email using SMTP. And there were all these protocols. There were like 80 different protocols, and everybody was trying to get a piece of the pie, and and people say, oh, this will never work, and it's too slow, and it's too clunky, and it's not secure, and, and the government's watching everything we do, and, and all these things. And I remember we, we made this investment in this little company that no one had ever heard of at the time called Sequoia. They were a venture capital fund, and we gave them some money, and they put a little bit of that money in this company with a funny name called Google. And at the time, we kind of laughed because we are like, what the heck? You know, there are already 20 search engines. The world doesn't need 21. You got right. AltaVista and Webcrawler and Lycos. And, you know, what do we need this, this <laughs> Google for? Well, they came up be, through this. And, and I've mentioned this 14-year cycle. And why is it 14 years? And I, I have a theory. I don't know exactly why. But my theory is that it has to do with all great innovation really is created by young people. And so it's, it has to do with the maturation of, of that generation of young people. And, you know, it's like Mark Andreessen when he invented the browser, you know, he wasn't mm -hmm. very old. Or, you know, the, the, the uh, engineers at uh, Fairchild when they invented the semiconductor. And, you know, all this stuff happens with these young, hungry, motivated. I think it's because they don't know any better. Right. Meaning no, I, th I not... think you're right. I think the world hasn't beaten them down yet. I think it's the same thing with art and music as well, where you see, you know, the, some of the greatest pieces of art that have been created were people in their late teens, early 20s. Same thing with like, I, you know, you look at uh, Mozart and Beethoven yeah. is, is the same thing. Yeah. And so I think you know, you're right. I think it's 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 the the world hasn't gotten to them yet. They don't know any better. Well, there's uh, this so great thing. Trying. and I, I can't use his name anymore because he's been discredited. But there's this famous, you know, uh, comedian from when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, now everyone hates him, but he, so, you know, does, does he have about, a, but, does he have a pudding? Uh, yes, exactly. Line? <laughs> exactly. And he created fat Albert, but uh, so this guy had this, this record album that I used to listen to, uh, with my parents. And, and there was this one thing about this, this little kid and he would say he could ride his bike anywhere. He could ride up on the top of a fence. He could ride up over the swing set. He could do circles where like his head was almost touching the ground and he never, ever fell. You know, the first time he fell when someone told him about gravity and Money transmitted. so that's, that's where, you know, we get to. So you get this creative class. So, you know, Sequoia creates this Google. We put in 500,000 bucks and we take out 200 million crazy right there should be a quad at wow. notre dame called the google quad and right that's not because i'm a genius that's because you know um michael moritz is a genius and don valentine for hiring michael moritz when he was a cub reporter at the wall street journal so and you know the guys at google are geniuses but the key is 14 years later you get the mobile net in 2010 and people forget that in 2005 when google bought android everybody laughed at him said what are you doing you know, what do you guys know about, you know, computing systems? Well, now they have 80% market share globally in, in handheld cellular or handheld supercomputers. I don't call them phones because no one talks on them anymore. No, but <laughs> I sure don't. <laughs> I know. It's just crazy. You know, I try to say, hey, I call my, I say to my kids, you know, call me. They're like, do what? We'll text you. We're not going to call you. Um, my, my fiance uh, she has a friend that likes to call her and we'll literally be sitting on the couch and the phone will ring and it'll be her. And the words out of her mouth are literally, why is she doing this to me? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, and, and I, what's really interesting is I remember being in, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. I was in Seattle visiting a friend and, and we went to this like, uh, tech get together, uh, put on by Craig McCaw's family office. And, you know, the guy who ran the family office, I'm talking to him, and, you know, Craig McCaw is the famous guy from, you know, did all the cellular companies. And I said, you know, do you think this, this mobile net thing is going to be as big as the Internet? He says, Mark, are you kidding me? You ask people, you know, 14 years ago if they want a computer, they're like, 
why would I want a computer in my house? You ask people today, do you want a cell phone? They're like, well, I already got two. I probably don't need a third one. <laughs> and so the ubiquity of a supercomputer in your pocket all the time, but now what's coming is 2024, which I would say, yes, I know that's four years from now, but 2024 is the blockchain era or what I've dubbed the trust net. So use it liberally. So we had the internet in 96, nice. which was all about connected devices. Then we had 2010, the mobile net, which was all about connected ubiquity. And 2024 is about connecting things of value and the internet of things or the internet of value. And so I call it trust net because what blockchain technology does, it establishes a single point of truth. And we, we trust now machines more than we trust people, right? When I get lost in Toronto a couple of nights from now, I'm not going to ask for directions. <laughs> Actually, don't it's call more me. appropriate um, in Montreal I where, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, where don't I call can't, chamber. Yeah where, where, yeah, where I can't speak French. So I'm not going to ask somebody. I'm just going to look at Google Maps. And it's, it's a really interesting place where we are in time because in the four years leading up to the announcement of the the age right that's when the biggest opportunities to make money so if you think back from 1950 to 54 you had this incredible opportunity to put capital in to venture capital around mainframes and then from 64 to 68 and then you know 92 to 96 and and i think back to all those early investments we made when people thought we were absolutely stupid and insane all turned out to be really good outcomes. Now, that's actually a rule of mine, right? If you ever make an investment and you feel really good about it, you're gonna lose money. And the better you feel, the more money you're gonna lose. And when you make an investment and you feel a little sick to your stomach, that's when you're gonna make money. And if you feel really, really sick to your stomach, you're gonna make a ton of money. <laughs> and so the key is to constantly avoid comfort in investing. You want to seek discomfort and you want to seek things that are new. And my pin tweet, right, is the, the greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in before others even understand. And that's really hard to do because you look stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I've looked stupid my whole <laughs> life. And it's been very profitable to be stupid because or to look stupid, maybe not to be stupid, but to look stupid. Because every thing that is accepted in the future at the beginning sounded stupid or heretical. And that's the way new things happen. And so what, what blockchain, the, again, the aha moment for me was that in order for, um, machines to interact with machines. And so in the future, when I'm sitting in the back of my autonomous vehicle and it pulls into the charging station, gets a quick charge, I'm not going to get out of the car and put my credit card in the machine. The car is going to pay the machine with crypto. And that's what's coming. And that's what people can't comprehend because they think of Bitcoin as a thing or Ethereum as a thing instead of thinking them as protocols that the key to technology is it is over when it's invisible, right? Hmm. That's interesting, yeah. When it's visible and everybody's talking about it, that's just the beginning. And right. so people say, oh, you know, you missed, you missed the Bitcoin thing. What do you, it hadn't even started, right? It's the Churchill quote. It may be the, it's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It may perhaps be the end of the beginning. And we've got so long to run on this. In fact, the, the crash, right, that we will have is still four years from now. So in 2024, we're likely to have a, a pause that refreshes, a crash that, that, that does the same thing that the 2000 crash did for the creation of internet companies. All the great internet companies were formed kind of post 2000. And then the same thing, the global financial crisis, which came, you know, about a year early compared to 2010, but that created the opportunity for the great social media companies to be created uh, with the mobile net. And I think the same thing's gonna happen with the trust net is, you know, we'll have all the hard work done between now and 2024 
and then we'll have this dislocation. People will think it's over, but then the, the gigantic wealth will be created. And hmm. you just got to be there. Chamber, I think the hashtag for 100%. The episode, I, got, that, I wrote it down already. <laughs> hashtag TrustNet 2024. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I like also it's profitable to look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one too. That's a good one. So uh, I, I have a question for you, Mark. Sure, sure. Um, I was I was listening to uh, an interview you had, and you had mentioned, uh, you know, kind of in in regards to this uh, this TrustNet uh, 2024 and all the things that are going to be happening. Um, you know, once once things do start kind of rocking and rolling, you had mentioned crypto stocks and crypto bonds. Yes. Um, I, I we were talking pre-show. I had never heard those terms before. Could you elaborate on on that a little bit for us? No, it's fantastic. I love I love nothing more fun than doing a show with people who have prepped and have great questions. And, and oh, it sucks. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. It's I, I love this because it's it's it, it makes it so easy to do my part, which is just you know talk. Um, cause you guys have unbelievably good questions, but the key here is if you think about, um, investing, right? There's only four things you can own in the world. Everybody tries to make it more complicated, but there are only four things you can own stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. Everything else either derives its value from a stock, a bond, a currency, or commodity. So you can have derivative instruments, options, futures, et cetera, but they derive their value from stock, bond, currency, or commodity. And then everything else is just a combination or an access point to those things. So people talk about hedge funds. Well, hedge funds is just a legal structure. In a hedge fund, you own a stock, a bond, a currency, or a commodity. Real estate. Well, in real estate, you're either on the equity of the deal, the debt of the deal, or the land, the commodity. Private equity. I own common stock, preferred stock, or a convertible bond. So all of those things come back to these four core asset classes. And it's kind of like the four basic building blocks of DNA, right? There's only four, yet we have infinite variability around the world from those four simple building blocks. So stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities can create lots of different things and create wealth in lots of different ways, but it still comes down to those four things. So today we are moving from the analog world, right? So we use today 400-year-old technology in the stock market. We still have paper stock certificates that sit at DTCC. <laughs> Why we do that is just absolutely inane. But then we use a electronic QSIP to represent that paper certificate. And then we trade in a broker account, which isn't ours anymore. So like when you put money in the bank, it's no longer yours. It's the bank's. Look on the asset balance sheet. You have an IOU, and maybe you get your money back, or maybe they'll let you buy crypto with it, unless you, you know, bank at Wells Fargo, then you can't. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, it's crazy, right? People don't understand that. I, well, I'll give you one anecdote about this. So I met a guy. His dad was a billionaire. Um, was the guy that first did syndicated television back in the 70s. Oh, that's profitable. Created, yeah, very profitable. <laughs> I mean, I paid every time I watched the Brady Bunch, which was right. a lot. And so his dad passed away. He inherits $960 million. Oh, my and God. I'm, no, no, crazy, right? And I'm talking to him at this party. And I said, what do you do with it? He says, well, you know, I'm really scared that something's going to happen. So I just, I just leave it in the bank. I'm like, you do what? 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 He says, well, it's in the bank. You know, I said, well, that's incredibly risky. He says, no, no, it's insured. I said, no, no, it's insured to $250,000. Yeah, that's it. So he did um, diversify into four banks. And unfortunately, the sad part of the story is during the global financial crisis, one of those banks went to zero and he lost oh. 25% of the money. So that sucks, technical term. But, yeah. but the point <laughs> is that... Um, uh, back to the original uh, question is if you think about the evolution of analog to electronic to digital, full digital ownership, I believe every asset in the world, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every private business, every piece of real estate, every everything will eventually be digitized, securitized. And those digital assets will be true digital ownership. Like today, like the other day, I got a paper title certificate of my trailer for my boat. I actually believe that the money it cost them to make that paper title was worth more than my trailer. <laughs> it's just ridiculous that that even exists. That should be on a blockchain. And you know, we've invested in a company that's now making home equity loans directly on a blockchain, stripping out cost, making it so much easier and getting rid of the need for title insurance. So huge disruptive power and more efficient and we're talking to another company that's going to do escrow settlements for real estate transactions on a blockchain. 
and get rid of the wire fraud that happens where people will sit outside the, the banks and they'll sniff the uh, email of the buyers. They'll send them an email saying, hey, send your money here and we'll hold it in escrow. And people actually click the link and lose all their money through wire fraud. So um, all of this stuff goes back to this core idea, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities. Today, we have crypto currencies. We have crypto commodities. So cryptocurrencies, there's only about a dozen of them, but that's you know Bitcoin and Ethereum and Dash and Monero and, and, and a few others. All those other things that people talk about, that people call cryptocurrencies are not, right? They're utility tokens. They're right. basically crowdsourced early stage and pre-seed stage venture capital. 95% of them are going to zero, but the ones that don't go to zero, you might make a hundred times your money, but you have to be technologically savvy to figure out which is which. But of those you know dozen or so cryptocurrencies, there is one so far that has been proven to be a crypto commodity, which is Bitcoin. And it is functioning as digital gold. Now, will it always be digital gold? I don't know. If you believe Paul Romer, which I do, you know, Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize this year uh, in finance. And, you know, it's kind of cool because 30 years ago, no, 33 years ago, 33 years ago, I read his paper in uh, business school called... Um, the law of increasing returns. And I used to tell people, you know, this guy's going to win the Nobel Prize. Well, it took 33 freaking years, but he did win the Nobel <laughs> Prize. And That's awesome. it is awesome. And, and the guy's amazing. And what he said is it's not always the best technology that wins, but it's the technology that gets out first and creates the biggest network effect. Because once the network effect takes over, it's just too hard to displace it. And if you think about gold, right, why gold? Why not silver? Why not bronze? Why not platinum? Why not palladium? Why not copper? I mean, there's so many things it could have been, but gold for 5,000 years has one ounce has bought a fine man's suit. So it's been a perfect store of value for 5,000 years. You go to Savile Road today, fine man's suit, 1,200, 1,300 bucks, right where gold is. So it has worked, but the problem with gold, again, back to Knight's Tale, bring it back to Heath Ledger. <laughs> In Knight's Tale, Heath wins the, the tournament and he gets this golden calf thing. He does. And he wants uh, his squire to go buy something or settle up a debt. And he bangs the thing on the, the table and knocks off one of the legs and says, go, go do whatever you do with that. That's a really bad way to divide money, right? Banging it on the <laughs> yes. table. And so the beautiful thing about uh, Bitcoin is it's divisible to eight decimal points and it's portable, right? All the gold in the world fits in two Olympic sized swimming pools and is very heavy all the Bitcoin in the world fits on my iPhone. Now I don't have all the Bitcoin in the world, so don't try to SIM swap me, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but uh, the reality is it's so portable, it's so divisible, it has all these benefits. And now, I, I'm not saying that gold has to go away. Gold has other valuable attributes, like you can physically put it in your pocket and take it with you if something bad happens. And we've got lots of stories about that during war and famine and flood and all that kind of stuff. But Bitcoin has so many advantages that I think it will eventually, you know, have a gold equivalence level, but then it goes beyond that because it can then be a currency. Today, it's not really a currency, a medium of exchange because it's slow. Well, why is it slow? Well, it's like when you're building a house, good, fast, and cheap, pick two. You know, you can have it good and fast, and it won't be cheap. You can have it good and cheap, and it won't be fast. You can have it cheap and fast, but it won't be good. And so in, in security or, or in, in networks, you either have secure or fast. You can't have them both. And so Bitcoin has chosen to be the most secure and safe computing system in the history of the world, right? Hundreds of millions of transactions, not one fraudulent transaction. I always ask people, how many times have you had to change your Visa or MasterCard number because of fraud? Millions. Millions, right? Like I've, tw tw every twice time this I, year. Twice I just this year. got a new one just sent to me because they were like, oh, we, th we think your card might have been compromised. I'm like, oh, okay. Yep. Th thank Send you. me a new one. Send me a new <laughs> one. And, and so what, what, what we're really going towards in this yeah, – sorry. I would say I don't do short well. So the answer to your question <laughs> is what are – crypto bonds and crypto stocks. So we've got cryptocurrencies, we've got crypto commodities. Ultimately, we're gonna have crypto stocks and crypto bonds. All that means is we're gonna move from electronic representations of analog securities to pure digital form 
and true digital ownership. So every stock in the world would be digital. Every bond in the world would be digital. Every asset in the world would be digitally represented by a token. And I always use the example of real estate, right? If, if you securitized or digitized the you know, Empire State Building, how many people could buy the Empire State Building today with cash, with fiat? Yeah, I don't know, a couple thousand, I don't know, maybe 10,000. I don't know what the number is, but it's not a huge number. How many people would like to own a piece of that iconic piece of real estate? A million? 10 million? 100 million? I don't know. It's a big number. And if it could trade 24-7 instead of by appointment whenever somebody wanted to buy it for fiat, uh, it totally changes the dynamic. And so I just look out and I say, okay, if you look at assets around the world, there's seven hundred trillion dollars of assets, and that's real estate, couple hundred trillion, and you got uh, private businesses, and you got all of the currency in the world at eighty-six trillion, and you start adding up all these assets, and as they become digital, and as we move to the digital age where the machines need cryptocurrency in order to function in the Internet of Things or the trust net it's all going to move in this direction. And that's why ultimately as a portfolio manager, and that's our you know slogan. So we created Morgan Creek digital as a subsidiary of Morgan Creek capital and Morgan Creek digital, you know, our slogan is, is asset management for the digital age. And so as we think about building portfolios in the future, it's going to be how do we most effectively manage portfolios of digital assets? Hmm. Very interesting. That is exactly what I wanted to hear. That's perfect. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> We're going to get along like, famously. I was like, oh, this is, uh, I, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to comprehend it, but you were, uh, I don't know. you, you I explained think Mark, that perfectly. I, I think Mark might be a Nobel Prize worthy someday. Nope. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wow. mean, <laughs> you, if you, you can explain it. Kind. Far too kind. <laughs> With the ability to explain to a couple of uh, simpletons like uh, Bunchu and myself, uh, you know that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty that's that's a pretty big talent you possess. Um, well, look, I appreciate that very much because that that actually is the nicest compliment you could pay someone is if if someone can communicate something simply without trying to sound you know pretentious or use big words or jargon. It's actually a really high compliment, so I appreciate that very much. Oh yeah, I have a feeling everybody's going to really dig this uh, this episode. It's good stuff. So, uh, Chamber, you got one more question? I do have an, we'll I do, do have another we'll question. Do rapid fire. Um, I, I did hear you mention, um, and I had never heard this before again. Um, but you were you were chatting with somebody in regards to um, kind of who Satoshi Nakamoto was, yeah. and then you had kind of uh, you know uh, brought up softly the fact that there was like cons like a conspiracy behind the name satoshi oh, nakamoto yes yes chambers I a huge conspiracy theorist he's like well he just seeks out conspiracy he's a, he believes in sasquatch that we were more of a contrarian than i grew a up with sasquatch come on i grew up <laughs> in the pacific northwest <laughs> there you go uh, in so olympia the, park yeah oh no we're, we are gonna get to we're gonna get along famously because there's not a conspiracy that's been created that i don't believe in <laughs> and, and and it's because conspiracies are real, right? They're called conspiracies by the people who create them to protect right. the rest of us. But here's the thing. If, if, you, if you look at all the things around Satoshi Nakamoto, so a couple things jump out. So one is, you know, if you just, if you just break apart the name – and have some fun with it, you know. Right. You can go. That's what I was. Samsung. Yeah, that's what I was hearing. Well, you can go. Well, this is. I'm going to give you the the, the, okay. the not as interesting one, and I'll give you the interesting one. But if you go, if you do Samsung, so mm -hmm. sa, so part yeah. of Samsung, and then um, you go Tosh for Toshiba, Toshi, so okay. Satoshi. Then you go Nakamichi and Motorola. So you think about these four big tech companies <laughs> came together <laughs> and created <sighs> this thing. So that's my one. head. My head just exploded. Interesting. No, no, I, I like that one. So then there's the second one, which is that no single person is really smart enough to design something so incredibly elegant. I mean, just just the whole logic of well, the only way to attack it is a 51% attack, but you would never get a 51% attack because if you did, it would immediately go to zero, and all the things that you just stole would be worthless. I mean. The genius of that is is absolutely incredible. So 
then the theory is, well, it was really four people, and they had a multi-sig wallet, and one of them has passed away, so that's why the Satoshi block has never moved. I mean, Satoshi wallet's never moved. But the one I really like is if you plug in the name Satoshi Nakamoto into a translator, you know, like a Japanese translator, say, what does mm -hmm. Satoshi Nakamoto mean from Japanese to English? You get Satoshi means intelligence, and Nakamoto means central, like from the central part of, of the island. So what? intelligent central, which if you just flip that around is central, central intelligence, intelligence or CIA. <laughs> and so the thesis is the U.S. government figured out that the dollar was doomed because of the debt problem and that people were going to migrate to other currency, sound currency. So they gave us this gift of this sound currency to get people to convert fiat in and they've got a back door and that once we're all in, they're going to take all our money. So I don't like that part of the <laughs> thesis, wow. but um, I do think it is possible that government or governments were involved. I mean, there's some other conspiracy theories about the Chinese government and, and given their advanced um, standing in, in AI and, and tech, I, that, wouldn't surprise me, given how dominant they were in the early days of mining. Um, but I'm sticking right now with the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto being intelligence central. That's a great. So good. <laughs> that was so good. That's a really good one. <laughs> I think that is a perfect spot to get into a little more uh, fun here. So we're going to head into a quick round of rapid fire. Ah, love so, it. Uh, yep. So, Mark, these are just random questions for uh, just everybody out there to kind of get to know you a little better. So, uh, non crypto related. Yep. Uh, let's go with uh, my favorite first one is always what would be your go to karaoke song? Oh, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. I've done it oh, many times. Oh, great one. I, in fact, one of the craziest nights of my life was doing American Pie. In the basement, windowless, imagine this, a windowless basement of a club in Korea, a whiskey bar, <laughs> where no address, so I couldn't tell anybody where I was, probably couldn't get cell phone out if I wanted to, and we're doing karaoke, and in walk this slew of, of glitterati people, and, and I was like, and, and the, guy, the, the host says to me, what is your decision? My decision is to go home right now because <laughs> this <laughs> is going to get so out of control. But um, so I went home. But uh, he was very offended, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, Miss American Pie would be. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, let's see. So we already got your favorite movie here. How about a uh, favorite television show? Mm. That one's tough because, you know, my go-to for years and years was, you know, I was a big Brady Bunch guy. I wanted to be Mr. Brady growing up. Thought I wanted to be an architect, but that's dated. No one even knows who Brady Bunch is. So today, and television is a funny thing because what is television now? So it's right. my favorite show is Billions. I love oh, great Billions. And, and I love it because, one, I know all the characters. Like I actually know, okay, that's, you know, Stevie and that's John and that's, and, and then what I really love is Andrew Ross Sorkin does such an amazing job. I'm sure there's other people too, but he's the one I know does such a great job at integrating kind of real life situations and real trades, you know, like the, the Nigerian trade, the Nigerian currency trade from a couple of years ago hmm, was so yeah. real time. It was awesome. And then, you know, they had, they had Wapner and, and Josh Brown the other day, and I thought that was awesome. So cool That's stuff. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Chamber, you watch that show? I do watch that show. Uh, yeah. One of the few shows that are uh, that portray cryptocurrency um, in, in a pretty positive light. Oh, and very, pretty... very positive. And the other one that does too, which is my second favorite, is Silicon Valley. Which oh, that's yeah. a great one. <laughs> it's just so epic. And, you know, the whole – the whole you know web 3.0 and internet 3.0 and and its links into crypto i mean it's all incredibly accurate and uh pretty cool actually um, no I, billions is creeping up like i've always been a breaking bad guy okay. uh like i think i've seen it like four or five times now uh yeah. but billions is really good they get like really good actors like yeah. guys that you wouldn't think who is the um 
a bunch you'll remember. Uh, he's the stand-up comedian. Um, he played the billionaire that dated Taylor. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Mike Birbiglia. Yeah. Mike yes, Birbiglia. Yeah, he's exactly. my he's one of my favorite comedians. He's actually. so good, and it, like I'd never seen him act much before, and I mean he was so good in that. They just do incredible. a good job. And I believe one of the main traders is a as a pretty big stand up comedian as well. I forget the name. Yes, name. yes, the um, guy that had the. Uh, I think it was like season two where he like shoots the gun in his backyard. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, they did, billions is if it's not in if you're not watching billions you should absolutely be watching billions. So I, I'm I'm a big fan. I, I like I like that uh, that pick mark. Yep. Uh, so I do have a favor. I do have a question for you here. Mm-hmm. Um, we we talked about conspiracy theories. I would be remiss if I did not ask you what your favorite conspiracy theory is. Oh, jeez. Uh, I get in lots of trouble with this one. All right, throw it that. This is this is this is a safe space. No, no, and it, and, and it's must, it's really funny because I, I, I literally could have knocked over Pomp and JW, my my partners in Mark Greek Digital, um, when I came out with this, and because they were just blown away. Because you know, Pomp on his podcast talks all about he asks people if they believe in aliens. Yes, and, <laughs> and I said, guys, you can talk about aliens all you want because. The moon landing never happened. So. Wow, you're a you're a non moon lander. Wow, oh, no, my favorite the, the commercial now, where it's the cartoon and they 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 drink the Red Bull and he's bouncing around and and uh, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, oh, don't worry, we'll go back to the we'll go back to Earth and shoot it in a studio. I'm like, oh, I love that. I love That's that. That's awesome. And, so uh, did did Stanley Kubrick uh, direct the moon landing? Is that what we're that, saying? No, I, no that, that is certainly possible. And my whole thing is like, look, where are the stars? You know, how do you have a flag standing straight out? There's no wind. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things. But well, the, it, the, the real bottom line for me is the speed at which it happened right, from beginning to end. And the average age of the engineer was 28. Of course, you know, I said before, all good stuff happens with young people. So maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. (laughs) Well, and there's so much, I would say, you know, I kind of lean with you on that one. Uh, But there's so much, there was so much of a race to the moon at the time. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense that they would have faked it just for, you know, national pride or, you know what I mean? I don't have a problem with getting to the moon. Maybe somebody's gotten to the moon sometime, but if they did, why don't we see the wreckage with telescopes? And we have telescopes now that could take us like literally right down the middle of the crater. So why I have can't a we camera see? that gets a pretty good shot of a full moon. Like exactly. <laughs> you know? So I, if 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 there was stuff up there, we should be able to see it. But my problem, my real problem, is not getting there; it's getting back off. That just didn't happen. There's just no way. Physic physics, just no way. Not enough fuel. Not enough capacity. Just no chance. So clearly, it was all about. Um, you know, winning the Cold War, and anyway, but that's my favorite. That's all right. Great, good, that's a great, great one. answer. I would, I came out of left field. I would never have pegged you for that. That's a good one. I am going on the record right now saying Mark is uh, my favorite interview of all of 2019. Oh, they, you're killing me. Uh, we're yeah, we're going to even. It's a pretty Q, good one. I'm throwing <laughs> Q3 and Q4 out the door. Uh, this is the so best good. one of the year. This is my that's favorite awesome. interview so far. All right, I got, uh, let's see, one or two more here, and then we'll wrap up. How about, uh, what was the f- your favorite concert you've ever been to? Oh, geez, so many good ones. Um, and my thing is, I love live music. I mean, I absolutely love it. I mean, I just went to Darius Rucker, had a blast. Oh, um, cool. <laughs> but my favorite of all time um, had to be ZZ Top uh, at their peak. Um, in the Steppen Center at Notre Dame. So the Steppen cool. Center is a little geodesic dome. It doesn't hold but a 1,000 people. I couldn't hear for three days after it, um, <laughs> and, and it was pretty awesome. That's I'm going to go awesome. on the record right now. Um, I saw ZZ Top four years ago. No way. Still hold up. Like, I, I didn't obviously see them in their, in their heyday, uh, but you know, it's, it's a real crapshoot when you go see these kind of these older oh, yeah. bands. Yeah. And they, I would imagine if you would see them today, they'd be just as good as you saw them in their peak. I, they I were so good. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and uh, you know, I, the one I am sorry I never went to because my parents were, were a little strict was Kiss. I wish. Oh, I <laughs> the Knights and Satan service. Yeah, oh my gosh. Um, 
in fact, so funny. In fact, Pomp got to hang out with Gene Simmons no. uh, a few weeks ago and uh, tweeted a picture of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm so jealous. Cuts oh, me deep. You Pomp, really cuts me deep. <laughs> oh, so oh, jealous. Wow. Pomp and, hobnopping with Gene Simmons. And it turns wow. out Gene Simmons is kind of a crypto guy and kind of a, a business genius. I mean, the really? guy. Was, yeah. I mean, wow. We yeah. all know Kiss was a, a, a merchandising uh, well, yeah, a machine. tornado. Ma- ma- yeah. Machine. I mean, yeah. Incredible. I mean, and, I think you could get a Kiss coffin if memory serves me correct. <laughs> wow no question yeah, i'm pretty sure you no could question. So good. <laughs> all right here's my last one for you it's i i mean you you went to notre dame um and we have been talking about conspiracies i'm sure you've heard this one was rudy offsides <laughs> um here's the thing <laughs> Rudy, I, asked, I asked Chamber this. Yeah. I said, I'm going to ask him this question. No, he, goes, so good. What, he goes, what the hell are you talking no, about? So <laughs> Don't worry, he'll get so, it. So Rudy was definitely not off sides, but the Rudy story, it's a little fictionalized. Um, let's just say that because one of my good friends was on the team, and let's just say that um, while Rudy was admired for his tenacity and his – um, you know, stick to itiveness and his, you know, willingness to, to take a beating. Um, <laughs> he wasn't beloved like, like the movie showed, but it's such a great story. It's one of my favorite movies. The guy who did the movie is, is amazing. And, and I will give Rudy credit. So, you know, he wanted Angela Puzo to, to direct it, the guy who did Hoosiers. Um, and he, he, he sent him the script and he said, no. And he sent it again. He said, no, he literally paid the mailman to tell him his address and <laughs> went to the guy's door and banged on the door until he finally answered and said, come on, do the movie. Wow. And, and he did. And the rest is history. Cause it actually is a great movie. Even yeah. If right. The story is a little bit fictionalized. That's pretty awesome. But That's no, crazy. I stand, I stand by that. He was on sides cause Notre Dame people always play by the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ch- Chamber, we're going to have to tweet out that picture I sent you earlier. I think we right? will for sure. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, that's all that we had, man. That man, that was such a fun interview, Mark. We really appreciate it. Um, just want to give you any um, the last couple seconds here to you know tell people where they can find you, how to contact you, what you guys are doing over at Morgan Creek, anything like that that you want to mention before we go. Yeah, look, I appreciate that. And, and look, I enjoyed this immensely. I, I had a blast tonight. I, I could have gone on for another couple hours easily. Uh, <laughs> just so much fun. You guys you guys did a great job. Um, I, you know, Morgan Creek is easy to find. So we're at morgancreekcap.com or morgancreekfunds.com. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter at Mark Yusko, M-A-R-K-Y-U-S-K-O. Uh, I'm there way too much, as my wife reminds me all the time. <laughs> um, but I love it. I love the community. I love I love the, the back and forth and, and the exchange of ideas. And I love things like this that come out of it. So um, I write a lot. There's a lot of uh, our newsletters on our, our website. Uh, and uh, one other thing is uh, I do a, a monthly around the world with USCO webinar and we pick random topics. I've done some on crypto. I've done some on China. I did one recently called Navigating the Seven Seas, China, Crypto, Crude, Commodities, Currencies, Convexity, and Correlation. Hmm. And uh, we put them up on a, a YouTube channel called Around the World with USCO, really creative. Uh, so if you go to YouTube, Google Around the World with USCO, all the old ones will pop up. The three that, that people listening to this might be interested in is I did a, a blockchain 101 uh, about a year and a half ago. I did crypto capitalism about nine months ago. And then I did get off zero, hashtag get off zero, which is our mantra at Morgan Creek Digital. We're trying to get individual and institutional investors to figure out that the most important asset allocation decision they can make for the next decade is to get off zero allocation of crypto assets. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, Chamber, we we got four more years, bro. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize this. This is terrific news. We'll do this. Uh, we'll do this every six months for the next four years. We'll have a party hey, at the end. Yes, and, uh, let's do it. We will ring in the trust net officially on uh, New Year's Eve, twenty twenty three. We got to get trust net uh, New Year's Eve glasses. You know, oh, the, uh, that'd be awesome. That's what we need. For yeah, they'll be, you know, they'll be like shaped like blocks, you know, <laughs> yeah. just block lenses. If I were, and... if I were really smart, I guess I would go out and get trustnet.com, wouldn't I? So hundred oh, percent. Yes. 
I think you should do that before this airs tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody's going to squat on it. <laughs> and then uh, we'll celebrate with a large karaoke party where you can sing Miss American Pie. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Hey, guys. Thanks Thank you so much, Mark. We appreciate it. And everybody out there, until next time, don't get wrecked. And that is financial advice. <laughs>